This evening's lecture, Music in the Age of Faith, Johann Sebastian Bach, begins a four-week series on the different periods of classical music. They will be the following Wednesdays, three more, all presented by Dr. Harrell. And we are pleased that he will present tonight the period that historians refer to as Baroque. Dr. Harrell received his PhD from Brandeis University. He is a musicologist and music theorist, focusing on the choral music of Bach. Professor Harrell is also on the faculty at Baroque College in New York City, where he was appointed an assistant director of the Jewish Studies Center. His interests range from jazz to popular music, as well as opera, Renaissance music, and co contemporary genre. Professor Harold is where he finds the time, is also an experienced jazz pianist and tenor vocalist, performing with groups in New York City and New England areas. Please join me in welcoming Gil Harrell to Darien Library. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you to the Darien Library and all the wonderful folks here who've made it possible for me to appear and to be presenting this series. Let me uh, suggest that uh, within the realm of each of these musical periods we'll be discussing over the next four weeks, uh, it would be impossible to do justice to the full range of works that these composers whom we're going to discuss uh, created. Case in point, Johann Sebastian Bach. I think it would be possible to create a lecture series that went on for about 10 years. <laughs> and even then, we might cover about half of Bach's works. Uh, some of you might be familiar with these three letters you'll see on the screen. BWV, that stands in German for Bach Werke Verzeichnis, the Bach work catalog. And there are over 1,000 excellent pieces in the Bach work catalog. I'm going to be talking about probably three of them tonight. So again, uh, let me just suggest that when I say we're going to be talking about the Baroque period, there are so many more things that we can say about the Baroque period that I won't have a chance to get to tonight. Rather, my intention is to kind of give us a glimpse into the world of Johann Sebastian Bach to look not only at music in the Baroque period, but in Bach's case to specifically look at German music in this, I think, amazingly fertile period of music history. And also to look at, we're going to narrow the scope a little bit further, to look at Central German, in this case, music from an area called Saxony. Uh, I'm going to be talking probably towards the middle of the program about a very famous encounter that Bach had in 1747 with none other than the king of Prussia, Frederick the Great. I was just standing uh, probably no more than a foot away from Frederick the Great's grave in Potsdam a few days ago. I just returned from Europe yesterday. So uh, it was kind of amazing to be standing at saint suis where Frederick the Great uh, spent his summers and where he had a famous showdown of sorts with Bach in 1747. It's a kind of heroic story uh, if you're a Bach fan. If you're a Frederick fan, it's probably a story you want to forget because the king was sort of humiliated. And uh, you might say that Bach turned the tables on him. Again, that's a story that I'll be getting to probably about halfway through the program. The clash between Bach and Frederick the Great is an important one because it represents sort of a clash of aesthetic ideals. Now, this is something I'm going to be talking about in next week's program, which is subtitled Music in the Age of Reason. Frederick was very much somebody who believed in the Enlightenment principles. He was uh, somebody who knows a little bit about Frederick the Great, know that one of his favorite chunks was Voltaire. And Voltaire actually spent three years living in Prussia at saint suis in the palace, the summer palace of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great uh, styled himself Frédéric. He spoke French. He dressed in the French style. He decorated his castles in the French style. And uh, once bragged to Voltaire that he had never read a book in German. Uh, he was the Prussian king. Uh, Bach, on the other hand, was German through and through, whereas Frederick was probably somewhere between an atheist and a deist. Bach, again, representing the Baroque period, was a very devout Lutheran. That's one of the themes that's going to come up today. Not everything that Bach wrote, of course, uh, was of a religious bent, 
but much of his music is, and sort of the culmination of today's program, towards the end I'm going to be talking about an oratorio, I'll say what that is when we get to it, uh, that Bach premiered on Good Friday 1724, and that is a piece that some of you may be familiar with, it's called the St. John Passion, or in German, Johannes Passion. So the plan for this evening is to talk about several different styles of music within Bach's output, starting sort of small and working our way up to the large scale. So we're going to start with some organ music, which you can believe that organ music can be small scale. Uh, it is only if we compare it to, again, that word I used earlier, the oratorio. So we'll start with an organ fugue by Bach, sometimes called the Little Fugue in G minor, WB 578. We're then going to be looking at an instrumental work that Bach composed sometime around 1721. This is from a collection of six pieces that some of you may be familiar with, and that's the Brandenburg Concerti, or Concertos, if you like. And um, then we're going to be concluding today, again, with the St. John Passion. So three works by Bach. Uh, I would suggest that they are wildly different, both in scope and, of course, in intention. Um, that's something that musicologists are often hesitant to engage, say, what's the point of this piece? Because it's very difficult to borrow into the head of a composer and say, why did you write this? Well, sometimes it's easy to trace, sometimes we listen to the music, and it's fairly straightforward. Sometimes, as is the case with works like the Brandenburg Concerti, we need to do a bit of digging. So we're going to do some digging here at Darien tonight. We may be a long way from Leipzig or from Eisenach, which is where Bach was born, or from uh, the court of Weimar, where he worked for some time, and of course the co court of Kirten, where he wrote most of his instrumental works. Bach never left home, probably more than 200 miles away from where he was born. Sometimes we compare him in this way to someone who is very much his contemporary. In fact, they were born in the same year. I think some of you know who I'm talking about, and that would be George Frederick Handel, or probably as his friends called him when he was growing up, Georg Friedrich. Uh, the George Frederick came later. Music in the Age of Faith. Bach was somebody who not only was a Lutheran, but was what historians sometimes refer to as a pietist Lutheran. When we say pietist Lutheran, in this case, we're talking about someone who was living a very intensely observant lifestyle. Bach's music, therefore, much of it, is not meant to make you as an audience think, boy, golly, that's a lovely melody. I'm just, uh, I think that's delightful, and this Bach guy really knows what he's doing, and I'm going to go home whistling that tune. Uh, the music exists for a wholly different purpose most of the time. There's a whole style of music that Bach worked in that we're not going to talk about tonight because it would really be opening, as they say in German, Die Büchse der Pandora, if we were to try to talk about these works, and they're called cantatas. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them tonight. We'll save that perhaps for a future program, but Bach's music, so much of it, is bound up in the style of the cantatas. I want to give you one example of such a work that I think tells us a lot about Bach's attitude towards music and its purpose. There's a cantata called uh, The Number is BWV 179, and in German, in BWV 179, the title of the work, it's not a well-known piece, but again, I think it gives us a real insight into this idea of music in this age of faith. It's called Sieh zu, dass deine Gottesverschicht heuchelei sei. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Let's break it down. For those who uh, have studied a bit of Deutsch, you might recognize an odd word there, the word heuchelei, which translates to hypocrisy. So the title of the work is, See to it that your fear of God is not hypocrisy. In other words, Bach saying to his congregation in Leipzig, Hey, don't come to church on Sunday if you were out uh, committing adultery on Saturday, if you were out gambling, if you were out doing something you shouldn't have been doing. Bach, I think, it's fair to say, had a healthy measure of, of fear for the idea of going to hell. The idea of hell comes up quite a bit in his music. In fact, in that same work I mentioned, there's a, a moment where a soprano has to sing a solo. And let me suggest that this soprano would not be Renee Fleming. 
<laughs> this is a father with a ten-year-old boy. Imagine a little ten-year-old Saxon boy singing. And what's, what are the words that this little lad has to sing? Well, in this aria, the boy sings the following. Hilf mir, Jesu, Gottes Lamm. Meine Sünden sind wie Eiter in die Beine. Ich versink in tiefsten Schlaf. Translation. Help me, Jesus, God's Son, Lamb of God. My sins are like pus in my bones. <laughs> I am sinking into the deepest slime. <laughs> Again, let me suggest, this is not the kind of music you'd listen to and sort of have this feeling like you're, the same feeling you might get listening to Beethoven's Eroka Symphony or some other triumphant work which makes us sort of feel uplifted. I think it's fair to say that Bach, at least in some of his music, intended to put the fear of God in his audience. And when I say the word audience, that's an anachronistic term for Bach. In the age of reason, we can start using that term. In the age of faith, that is to say in the Baroque period, I think for someone like Bach, it's more accurate most of the time to use the word congregation. We're going to see that in our final piece for today, the St. John Passion, not meant to be performed in a big concert hall, not meant to be performed for lay listeners who are sort of there for, for an enjoyable evening. It was meant to be performed on the most solemn day of the year, on Good Friday. It's a piece that's supposed to encourage introspective meditation on the meaning of the passion. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means exactly, what the passion story entails. I'm sure, sure many of you are familiar with it. Well, that's going to be helpful because we're going to look at how Bach sets it. And uh, again, that will give us some insight into this remarkable time. Now, I did see a hand up earlier. And I think that it's uh, in order to encourage a kind of more college lecture style atmosphere. I'd love to take questions. So if you have a burning question during the program, uh, please feel free to ask me now if it's, if it's something that's uh, germane or, or something that interests you about what I'm saying in real time. Okay, well, in that case, let's go on and let's test the, uh, let's test the waters here. Make sure that this is all plugged in. All right. Maybe it was just a loose one. Maybe not. What do you mean to say? You're trying to play it? I'm not trying to play it yet, but I, it would be great if it stopped flashing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look at this. Oh, well. Let's give it a shot. Definitely not be doing that. Should we try to, to unplug? <laughs> well, this didn't start until after the program began for me. Let's try it. If only they had an organ here, then I could I could do my best with that. All right. Yes, you know, organs and pianos. This, I think we fixed it. Thanks. Let's try. Let's try. I think this will work. We're going to, to be continued in a moment. Since someone uh, mentioned the organ and the piano, I think it's fair to point something out about Bach, that in his own lifetime, people didn't regard him as Bach the great composer. That came much later. When I say much later, I mean a century after he died. In his own lifetime, Bach was considered Bach the great organist, Bach the virtuoso keyboards, not Bach the brilliant composer. That came much later. Really, that's associated with a figure we're going to discuss on lecture, the day of lecture three, Felix Mendelssohn. For those who know Mendelssohn, one of Mendelssohn's great contributions to the Western canon is sort of resurrecting Bach's music after a long period uh, where he was relatively unknown. So what's the difference between a piano and an organ? Bach was known as a great keyboardist. What does keyboard mean? Well, in Bach's day, they would have used the word clavier. And clavier can mean any number of things. Today we think of a piano, but let's remember that in Bach's day, the piano, such as, as it is in this room, didn't exist. Now, pianos did exist starting around 1700. They're associated um, with Italy at first. They make their way up to Germany. Frederick the Great was a collector of pianos. And during that fateful meeting when Bach came to his palace in Potsdam, he asked Bach to improvise on no less than 17 pianos in the palace. 
Um, but Bach did not like the piano. He was a man who was born in 1685, and the piano was a new type of contraption. Didn't have the stability or the sound of this piano in this room. And for Bach, uh, he preferred the sound of the harp support. He also, presumably, when he was at home, played the clavichord, which is a smaller keyboard instrument. But really, his main instrument is the organ. And organs are to pianos, perhaps as squares are to rectangles, or rather vice versa. Let me explain what I mean by that. A square satisfies the criteria to be a rectangle, doesn't it? But a rectangle is not a square. A pianist cannot play the organ. An organist can play the piano. And of course, what separates the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, is that when you play piano, you only have to use your foot for one pedal. On an organ, you've got to use your feet, your heels and toes, to play actual melodic lines. And Bach doesn't treat the pedal parts, as we call them, the foot parts, with kitty gloves. Anything that you can play with a hand, Bach expects you to play with your feet. Remember, he wasn't writing music and thinking, well, golly, I really hope that uh, 300 years from now, students in uh, America can play this music. Um, he was writing for himself and for his kids. So the music is incredibly demanding for its time because it was written by a guy who didn't intend for anyone else to play it. We're going to listen now to a piece which is called A Few. Some of you may be familiar with that word. Actually, Bach was somewhat obsessed with few. In fact, towards the end of his career, he was criticized very heavily by a guy named Johann Otto Scheiber. And Scheiber wrote a, a review in a, in a music journal and he said, you know what, Herr Bach's music is very good. I had a chance to attend a concert and his music is quite good. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Herr Bach has to ruin his music by clouding it with excessive counterpoint. What does that mean, counterpoint? Counterpoint is a word that musicians use to refer to the independence of melodic lines. Let me give you an example of the piano. Next week you're going to hear me talk about Mozart. And before we listen to Mozart, it's so nice because the ear is not encumbered. The ear is not burdened with listening to several independent things. We hear something like this.
Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this is not as easy as Bach gets, by the way. Um, and if you listen for what sort of the guiding principles, I think sometimes we use the word imitation. The right hand begins, the left hand plays the exact same thing, but when the left hand enters, guess what? The right hand's off to the races. Right? If I were to really slow it down, we can hear this theme. And my left hand comes in and plays that same theme. That's a fugue. Here we're going to listen to an organ fugue by Bach. Bach's organ fugues were part of the Sunday service. Almost invariably, they would be used for different parts of the Sunday service. Uh, for before the sermon, often you have a fugue that was played. Sometimes after the sermon, certainly at the conclusion of the service itself, there would be more organ music played. So, so much of Bach's music is bound up with uh, specific, we can almost imagine them being bound up with specific services. Uh, we don't necessarily know what those services were, if it was for a Christmas service, or if it was for uh, an Easter, or Good Friday, or the Feast of St. Michael, or the Annunciation, or Palm Sunday. But if it was a Sunday, then you could guarantee there was going to be some kind of organ music playing. And most of that would, would include fugues. Again, this is, you'll see on the screen, the little fugue in G minor. That's because some years later, Bach would go back and write one about twice as long Musicologists call that one, go figure, the great fugue in G minor. Here is the little fugue in G minor. Again, to illustrate this, this idea of counterpoint, keep an eye on all of the different parts. So you'll see color-coded parts. Every one of those parts has to be played by the organist. So what you're about to hear is played by one person and one person alone. The bottom line, that is to say the bottom voice in this case, uh, is going to be played exclusively with the feet. So you'll see that color coded as well, and you'll notice that the feet have to play everything that the hands play. Bach's little few in G minor.
colors? In sure. There? Yes, the colors refer to uh, what musicians sometimes refer to as tessitura, or in this case, line. So the top one, the green part, is the highest voice, and that would be played in the right hand. And when I say right hand, I really mean the, the third, fourth, and fifth fingers. Because we also have a purple, let's call it, or I don't know, pink, pink. line. No, let's call it pink. Um, that is a second independent voice, and that can be played either with the thumb and index finger of the right hand, or the thumb and index finger of the left hand, depending. Sometimes they'll swim, swap uh, very fluidly. Then you have the orange line, will be played with uh, three, four, and five on the left hand. And then, of course, you have the purple part, which is played exclusively with the feet. So that's, uh, and again, this is about as easy as a Bach organ fugue gets. Uh, if, we, if this were a program solely on organ music, uh, let me suggest that we could do 10 programs solely on organ music, and there would be interesting and new things to say about each piece. Bach was a prolific composer who worked with a lot of uh, chorale preludes. In other words, he would take sort of vocal melodies that are associated with certain texts, especially from the Lutheran hymnal, and he would set them for organ in the most uh, amazing ways. We call those the, chor the chorale fantasies. And they're part of what Bach called the Orgelbüchlein. Another irony is that the word Büchlein in uh, German means sort of little book. And there's nothing little about this book in terms of the, the scope of these pieces. So Bach, again, if you were to comb through his output, you're looking at over 150 works for organ. And uh, this is about as simple as they get. So there's a, a guy who uh, plays quite a bit in New York. His name is Cameron Carpenter. And he's probably one of the greatest living organists today. And he's, I don't know, 36 years old or something like that. Uh, and he plays a lot of Bach organ fugues. I just saw him in the green space a couple of months ago. And he plays everything, and he plays it very fast. And I, and I once asked uh, my old uh, piano teacher about, uh, this is years before I knew who Cameron Carpenter was. I asked him about Glenn Gould, another famous Bach interpreter. I said, why does Glenn Gould play so fast? And my teacher looked at me and he said, because he can't. <laughs> There is some musicological scholarship that suggests the idea that Baroque music was played pretty fast, faster than we think, that faster than the, the modern interpreter would, uh, would play it today. Remember that in the Baroque period, there's no such thing as a metronome. Metronome was invented around 1815. So really, Beethoven is the first composer to benefit from the metronome. Um, we're going to talk about that next week, by the way. That'll be, let's see how I'm giving you the... <laughs> Um, so without a metronome, it's hard to know exactly how, Bach, how fast Bach wanted. He didn't write the typical Italian directions of Allegro, Allegro Moderato, Vivace, Prestissimo. He didn't really write that. He just wrote notes on a page. And it's up to us, performers and, of course, scholars and musicologists, to try to figure out what that means. And so you'll find that interpretations are all over the place. Case in point, our next piece which is the Brandenburg Concerto. There are six of the Brandenburg Concerti that I could have chosen. I've chosen to go with number four because it has an interesting property that I think many of you will enjoy and appreciate. And even if you know the piece, I think uh, it will sort of bring it to a, a, a new, to a new perspective. First, let's start with this type of Brandenburg Concerto. Brandenburg, of course, refers to a province or sort of a region of Germany. Remember before 1871, there is no Germany as we know it. Um, Germany was really a collection of states and, and principalities and municipalities and dukedoms and, and so on and so forth. Brandenburg was uh, the area where Potsdam was located, so uh, just a little bit north of Berlin. And this was in the time of the, again, this age of the Baroque period, Potsdam was one of the most important cities in Prussia. It was the capital of Brandenburg. And so when Bach wrote these Brandenburg concerti, he wrote them for one reason, and that was to make some money. He was trying to score an honorarium from the Margrave of Brandenburg, a guy named Christian Ludwig, who happened to be the cousin of Frederick the Great. The Brandenburg concerti are remarkable pieces because I think probably the most interesting aspect to this collection is that each one is different in terms of its instrumentation. When I say concerto, what do we think of? 
Think of Mozart, right? He wrote 27 piano concerti, five violin concerti. We think of Beethoven, the Emperor Piano Concerto comes to mind, number five in flat major. Maybe we think of Tchaikovsky, the violin concerto, or the piano concerto, B flat minor. Maybe we think of Edward Elgar. Are there any cellists in the room? Well, if you're a cellist, you probably think of Elgar because he wrote a very famous cello concerto in minor. Uh, the idea of a concerto focusing on one soloist is very much, I think, how most people relate to the concerto. The Brandenburgs are not like that. They're in the style of the what's called concerto grosso, which, again, is a Baroque thing. Concerto grosso died out after Bach. And it referred to this idea that you'd have two ensembles on the stage. You'd have your Ripiano group, and then you'd have your concertino group. Ripiano in Italian roughly translates, in this case, to the sort of the padding group. And their job was just to double the soloists, sort of thicken the sound. So in each of the six Brandenburg concerti, Bach chooses a different concertino group. That means a different group of soloists, not one soloist, as you would find in Mozart or Bach and Beethoven, excuse me, or in uh, Tchaikovsky or Brahms. Not one soloist, but rather many soloists. It's usually three or four. So, for example, Brandenburg I features in the solo group French horns, which were not easy to play back then, they didn't have valves, and what's called a, a piccolino, a violin piccolo. So a, a violin that's smaller than a violin and two just a little bit higher, to a major third higher. In Brandenburg II, what does Bach choose for his solo group? He got an oboe, he got a violin, you have a piccolo trumpet. You've never heard one of those. You've got to check it out someday, Brandenburg II. Uh, an instrument that plays like a trumpet, but it plays a perfect fifth higher, so it's much higher pitched. And finally, a recorder. And that brings me to Brandenburg IV. Uh, the reason I chose this piece is because when I say recorder, the instrument, how many people here play the recorder at some point in their lives? Yes. How many people here have been exposed to recorder play, or maybe I should say subjected to recorder <laughs> play? Maybe a, one of your children or grandchildren or your neighbor or a nephew or something like that, or a little brother. The recorder's got a bad rap, doesn't it? After all, today you see a recorder, you lay eyes on it, it's usually made of PVC pipe, probably imported from China, and uh, got of the highest quality, mass produce, and they sound sort of somewhere, I would say, maybe one rung higher than a kazoo in terms of how people <laughs> perceive the sound. I'm going to use a word here that comes from French, but sometimes we use the word timbre to refer to the quality of the sound. And the recorder is a bad rap because they give it to kids you know, second graders or what have you. And they say, here's a recorder, now we're going to play on three hot cross buns. <laughs> and there we have a little lamb. And so I think we as a society have become conditioned to think of a recorder as a sort of kiddie toy uh, that's not capable of playing serious music. Let me suggest that that was not the case in Box Day. And that the recorder was an instrument capable of a tremendous range and had a very specific timbre, quite different from a flute. Bach actually would have used the word flute to describe what we call a recorder. He might have written Lockflöte or just Flöte, which is flute. If he wanted this kind of flute, he'd have written Flauto Traverso, transverse flute, in other words, played like this, not like this. So Brandenburg IV is a piece that combines the following instruments in the solo group. You've got two recorders, an alto recorder and a tenor recorder. So they're not the little kitty instruments, they're a little bit bigger. One is about this big and the other is about this big. And then we have a violin. The violin is sort of the workhorse of any of the Brandenburg uh, concerti. So that's going to be your solo group. We've also got an interesting rhythmic device that Bach's going to put in here. This is what's called in, in music uh, terminology, we call this hemiola. Sounds like some kind of blood disorder, doesn't it? <laughs> oh no, I've got a hemiola. <laughs> well, a hemiola is a rhythmic device, and you'll hear it, I think it's quite pronounced in Brandenburg for Bach was very fond of using hemiolas. It's when you are, are counting music in a triple meter, so for example, one, two, three, one, two, three, 
One, two, three. Now let me conduct what that looks like. That would be down, out, up. So if I'm conducting the three, one, two. Sometimes what Bob will do is this. Want, 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 want. So you also want, 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 want. All the while it's moving in three, if you look at the sheet music, it's in three. What it does is it will make you as a listener perhaps a little bit unsettled, a little bit uneasy as the music makes its way towards the arrival points. We call those arrival points cadences. It's one of the real delightful, charming things I think about the first movement of Brandenburg Concerto number four is all of this hemiola that you get. Every time there's a big arrival, Bach gives you a hemiola. So I'll try to sort of conduct along and show you what that looks like when we get to those moments. Let me say one more thing before I play it. Bach didn't often write purely instrumental music. Again, this is the age of faith, so much of his music is of a, a religious bent. But there was a brief period of about five and a half years where Bach worked in the town of Anhauskirchen. He went there because he's a family man, and this had the best schools for his kids who were growing up. There were other reasons as well. But that was one of the major ones. It was in Curtin that Bach wound up writing the majority of his instrumental works because Curtin was a Calvinist area, Calvinist town. And so Bach was a devout Lutheran, was not writing music for the weekly services. So this is where we get a lot of his instrumental works. It was a time for Bach that I'm sure he was probably uh, quite happy to be there because his boss, Prince Leopold of Curtin, was an avid musician who really sort of worshipped Bach and uh, you could say uh, made, a, made him an offer to quote from the Godfather, made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Uh, and so Bach worked there until the prince uh, died. Here's Brandenburg Concerto number four. Again, we're listening for two, con uh, in the concertino group we have two recorders and a violin. The violin is going to be the color yellow in this, since someone asked about that. We'll see the color yellow here representing violin. We'll see the colors uh, over here. You'll see green, and I believe I, I would call that a sort of, a, I don't know, aquamarine, or let's call it blue for simplicity. Uh, that's going to be the other recorder. So let's have a listen. <laughs>
just the first movement, by the way, of a concerto that, like all of the Brandenburg concerti, has at least three movements. I think some of you probably were engaged with this video presentation, and I can see a few faces were sort of going up and down looking at different parts. <laughs> One of the things about music is that we tend to appreciate it. I mean, this is a sort of the phrasing that we use in musical circles. Sometimes when I teach what's called ear training lab, I say to my students, you have to train yourself to hear vertically, not just horizontally. Horizontal means you follow one line. Vertically means you hear the sonorities, the harmonies, the sort of underlying uh, elements that enrich and augment the melody that's more apparent. And so having a score as it is, such as it is here, really helps, I think, to appreciate just how complex this music is. The level of independence is both spellbinding, but also can be disoriented. Because you can really get lost in it. And if you're playing it, and if you're trying to listen to a bass line at a concert, or a middle voice, let's say a viola part, that's not easy to do. So let me uh, just suggest that one of the great things about listening to Bach is that it's music that really, really benefits from subsequent listenings. Because you'll hear things that maybe perhaps you didn't hear uh, the first couple of times. That brings us to our last piece of the evening. Time really flies when I'm talking about Bach. <laughs> I just had a question about what material uh, were the recorders made from? Great question. They were made out of wood, usually uh, oak or some other sturdy wood. Um, there are records of uh, particular recorder makers who were in guilds. That is to say that they were probably descended from recorder makers. So these things were carved out of blocks of wood, and they were done with extreme precision, with uh, you know, making sure that each hole was tuned correctly and so that the instrument could play whatever key it was made to be played in. Um, in fact, if you were to, for example, where I went to school at Brandeis, they have a wonderful early music instrument collection, and those are also hand-carved uh, recorders that they have there. Probably those are 19th century recreations. Uh, to find an authentic Baroque flute, or, or a recorder in this case, that'd be a, a pricey thing to have on your hands. So they really were made by experts, and that knowledge was you know, passed down from the Renaissance. Yeah. Well, what is the magenta um, the line and the purple line? Great question. The bottom lines in, uh, in Bach, in this case, uh, let's start with the, the purple line on the bottom, is what we call the basso continuo. It's just what it sounds like. Continuous bass line, and that would be really comprised of two instruments. That's why you have it doubled there. And so you have cello, and usually you would have a harpsichord that's also playing the left hand doubling of cello. So that's. Uh, the harpsichord wasn't on. Yeah. So there, there is harpsichord here, um, but uh, it's a little bit tough to hear. It's not the, the loudest instrument. That's one of the reasons the harpsichord sort of went the way of the dodo bird. It's not as an expressive as a piano, but it doesn't have the same volume. On a harpsichord, if I sort of tap the key, or if I uh, pound it, I get the same volume on a harpsichord. So it's sort of limited instrument. That's a, a topic for another day, though. I could go on and on about the mechanics of the harpsichord, and the evolution of the 14th piano, etc. Sir? Could you uh, speak a little bit about the man during the time that he created the two pieces that you presented tonight. And a few, there seem to be sort of, I don't have a train here, but a uh, calming, challenging sense to the music. And in the concerto, there seem to be a more pastoral sense. Did he emotionally change a great deal during that period? Uh, that's a great question. So first of all, you're very perceptive that this Brandenburg number four does have, I've always felt it has a sort of pastoral quality. It's in G major, it has a, a, a time signature which is counted in triple. There's something lilting about it that conjures up images of rolling fields or something like that. Um, did he change? The truth is, we know very, very little about Johann Sebastian Bach the man. He didn't write letters to uh, people with whom he corresponded. Uh, so for example, that's how we know a lot about Mozart. Mozart traveled and he wrote to his daddy and we have those letters. Mozart wrote to his cousin, we have those letters. They're quite vulgar. Um, yes. For those of you who know a little bit about Mozart's personality, we're going to talk about that next week during the program. Um, 
We just don't know much about Bob. He was born in 1685. It was not an era where people tended to keep journals or diaries. Um, people tended to go about their work, especially a man like Bob. I think it's fair to say, as his biographer Christoph Wolf says, that Bob was a man who really enjoyed family. And that says, as Wolf said, I, I gave you the PG version. I think Wolf phrases it. He said, Bob was a man who enjoyed the conjugal bed. Uh, <laughs> He was a man who spent a lot of time in church. He taught in church, not just music, but he taught Latin, he taught theology. So um, as far as Bach, the man, what he may have been thinking, it's very tough to say. We do have certain pieces that reflect a, a deep understanding, uh, of, or I should say, a, his perspective on certain sort of theological narratives. And that's going to bring us to our last piece, which hopefully will somewhat answer the question here. Um, of what Bach the person is like. We're going to be looking now for the next 10 minutes or so at the same job passion. I could talk for a long time about this piece. I uh, often used to, to, uh, to boast, actually, last week I was in Germany and uh, I was talking to, a, to someone that, that I had met there and uh, I said, uh, what if I told you I could recite the Gospel of John chapters 19 and 20 in German right now? And she said, Nein, das ist unmöglich. <laughs> it's impossible. Das glaube ich. I, I wouldn't believe that. So, of course, I went through it. And she said, how could you possibly know that? Being American and not even Christian, how could you know that? <laughs> and I said, well, it's Bach. You know, when you listen to this stuff, it sort of burrows itself into your ear. The story of the passion is, is one that's well known, so I won't go over it uh, so exhaustively right now. We're going to pick up uh, about an hour into the piece. So let me set the stage for you. Imagine it's Good Friday, and you're heading to the Thomas Kirche in Leipzig to go sort of meditate on the meaning of the Passion story. The Passion story, of course, for Bach, this piece starts in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus is arrested uh, by the henchmen of Caiaphas. And he's taken first to Caiaphas and Annas, then he's taken to the Roman governor of Judea, a guy named Pontius. Pilot, and we're going to pick up at this section. An oratorio, I use that word at the beginning, is kind of an unstage biblical opera. That's how you might think of it. So it has all the trappings of opera. It has characters, it has plot, it has a narrative, it has twists and turns, good guys, bad guys, but it's based in a biblical story, and in this case it's the Gospel of John chapters 19 and 20. Jesus is brought before Pilate, and of course, in John's narrative, there are four gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the last one is John, written about 70 CE. In the last one, John, what does John sort of say about the, the crucifixion narrative? He says, well, Jesus is brought to Pilate, and Pilate <coughs> thinks that Jesus is a really great guy. And it says, so from then on, Pilate, once he talks to Jesus, he sort of starts conjuring up ways that he can free Jesus. Let me say something about the St. John Passion as a musical piece. It's kind of a controversial work. Some of you may know a little bit about this. Um, in some communities, there are, there are people who don't perform this piece because they feel uncomfortable doing it. I've talked to many singers uh, who don't like doing it because there's something about the piece that tends to sort of stir up a very uh, excited and maybe even uh, a sense of hostility in the listener. Because the, the blame in the Gospel of, of John tends to be shifted away from Pilate and then therefore onto the people who handed Jesus over to Pilate, i.e., as they're called in the score, the Jews. And of course, it's even more insidious to a Western ear because we're going to hear it sung in the original language, so when Bach writes it, he writes, Dilun. And of course, anybody who studies the 20th century will hear that, and it, almost something about just that, those words, Dilun, sounds very unpleasant. So to hear these sort of high-pitched German voice, German singing voices uh, singing that. Let me just remind us that this is a text from the first century. And so if you were to go back and look at the original ancient Greek, I think it's Hoyu de Hoy or something like that. Um, there's a guy at Swarthmore College, a colleague of mine, Michael Morrison, who wrote a book called Bach, Lutheranism, and Anti-Judaism, where he says, well, you have to go and look at Bach's whole life. He was a Lutheran. We know that Luther in the 1530s, wrote a treatise against 
against Jews in Germany. It's called Andi Andi Yud and Newton, I think, on the Jews and their lives. So this is a piece that has a lot to talk about that's bound up in the text. I think I'm going to focus on Bach's music here. And if we have time, I'm going to look at just two short sections. First is what we call a turbo chorus. Here, the chorus, how many people here have sung the chorus? So in Bach, St. John Passion, the chorus, you get to be not only the chorus, but the chorus sometimes sort of plays the role of the crowd. they part of the drama. And in this case, you're going to hear, I think it's uh, Pilot, in this section I've queued up, Pilot's going to start saying, Behold the man, vacant, I wish. And then he says, Behold, for I find no guilt in him. And then he says, so the score of the Jews are going to scream, Crucify him, crucify him. And wait until you hear how Bach sets this stretch of music. It's very short, but it's, uh, I think, disturbing uh, is, is a word that comes to mind sometimes. But powerful and, of course, beautiful in a way. So this is the end of the chorus, and we're going to resume right after they finish this section. If you're looking here, that's Masaki Suzuki, who conducts the Bach Collegium Japan, one of the best ensembles in the world for Bach. So they hit Jesus. integrated into the drama, so it's going to be flowing into the next words. You can see that the piece is almost two hours long. Now, some of us might have found that, of course, a little bit disturbing. I think there's a musical reason for that. It's, it starts with a D. It's the word dissonance. There's a lot of dissonance in that particular choral movement. We also have the phonetic quality of the German being shouted. One word, over and over again, around four voices. Kreuzige. Kreuziger, 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 Kreuziger. It shows us, I think, there's a lot you can say about this, and perhaps we're opening up a bit of a Pandora's box by, by uh, getting into a work as deep as the passion. But I wanted to use it as a demonstration to show you Bach's dramatic side. We often think of Handel as being sort of the dramatist of this, of this century, of this era. And yes, of course, Handel grows up, he moves over to Italy. From Italy, he goes over to London, where he spends most of his life. In London, he would write many oratorios, again, those opera-like, opera on, uh, they're not actually staged, they're unstaged, no costumes, no moving around the stage, uh, no blocking choreography, etc. But we do have uh, characters and a plot. We think of Handel as being the great musical dramatist of the Baroque period because he wrote, well, for one thing, this one. Uh, the 
the Hallelujah Chorus from the Messiah Oratorio. Um, Handel wrote many Old Testament oratorios, including Samson, Saul, uh, Israel in Egypt, if you know that one, Judas Maccabeus, one of one, Jephthah, story from the book of Judges. Uh, so Handel was a great dramatist, not taking that away from you. But if you look at Bach's passion settings, there are two that survive, Johannes, uh, the Johannes Passion, the St. John, and later the Matthew Passion, a couple of years after that, 1727. Uh, Bach was every bit the dramatist, I think, and it reflects a deep study of the text that he set. Bach didn't sort of just look at it cursorily and, and set it to music. He really lived with these texts, and we know that because if we go through his library, one of the few relics that survived from his lifetime, we see he kept copious notes, not only in his Bible, but also he collected books of sermons. And he would read through these sermons by Luther and theologians, and he kept copious notes on those as well. If we had more time, I would say more about this, but uh, I wanted to give you a, just a little sampling of a very powerful section from a large-scale work, in this case, again, to use that word, an oratorio. Um, I think Bach maybe was the last great oratorio writer. Um, you could make the case that composers Beethoven tried his hand in oratorio. He wrote a work called Christ on the Mount of Olives. Not a well-known work by Beethoven. There's a reason it's not a very well-known work. <laughs> Uh, Felix Mendelssohn would write a piece, uh, two famous oratorios, one on the life of St. Paul and one on uh, the Hebrew Bible prophet Elijah. Um, Elijah is better known of the, of the two. I don't love that piece. I don't, I don't think it's uh, in the same league as a Bach or Handel oratorio. But nonetheless, uh, there's lots more to say about Mendelssohn and, uh, and Beethoven. And we will say more about them in subsequent programs. So, um, folks, I want to really thank you so much for coming out tonight. It's about 100 degrees, and it would be very easy to say, you know what? Bach's great, but you know what's better than Bach? Air conditioning. <laughs> and so to see so many folks come out uh, for this introductory program, get this uh, ser series of errors uh, jump-started with some very complex music. This is not the most uh, listener-friendly music. It requires patience. It requires, I think, uh, some willingness on the part of the listener to sort of borrow inside the music and try to hear uh, various moving parts simultaneously. So uh, I want to thank you again for, for coming out. And of course, at this time, if we have time, I would love to take questions. I know there are probably Probably some things about Bob, about this particular piece, maybe, since I, I opened up that can of worms, I'd be happy to say more about it. Yes. Um, what is a musicologist? You've got a PhD in musicology. Yeah, that's a great question. I get asked this question all the time, and sometimes my answer, when I want to be cheeky, is I, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, musicology is a study of music that uh, combines certain, let's say, disparate aspects of studying music. So a composer learns how to analyze harmony. A musicologist might learn how to analyze harmony, might be very good at doing it. Um, but a composer wouldn't spend so much time studying biography, or semiotics, or hagiography, or uh, theology. Composers are not so interested in that. A music theorist is not so interested in that. We don't really care that if the guy who uh, to the two men who took Jesus off the cross were Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea. A composer wouldn't, want to, wouldn't be interested in that, and a uh, music theorist would. A musicologist would. Does that answer the question? A uh, musicologist is also going to be interested in geography and nationalism and sort of broader cultural events. Uh, for example, if we're studying the Enlightenment, you know, a musicologist would be very interested in looking at the French Revolution. They'd be interested in looking at paintings by Delacroix. Uh, if they're studying Baroque music, they'd be interested in looking at uh, palaces from the Baroque period. As one of my students famously said last semester, I, I asked, uh, what was the most famous palace of the Baroque? And the student would raise his hand brazenly and said, oh, that's easy, professor. It was the Palace of Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, that's right, that's where King Louis lived. <laughs> So I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, would you see uh, the influence of Bach in any current musical work by rock star and pop group? 
groups? Yes, that's a great question. Um, the influence of Bach is widespread. We see it in so many places. If we were to go back to the, let's say, 50 years after Bach died, you see it in Mozart's Requiem. You see it in Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. You even see it in the finale of the Ninth Symphony. You see it in Brahms. You see it in Mahler. It, nowadays, in pop music and contemporary music, you do see it. And you know where you see it? It's, this may surprise people here. You see it in Swedish and broadly Scandinavian uh, power metal and symphonic metal. There's a guy named Ingve Momstein, who's a very famous uh, heavy metal guitarist. And he plays Bach fugues, uh, set with heavy metal beats and heavy metal uh, uh, accompaniment. But you do see it there. You see it in the Beatles, too, by the way. Something like Penny Lane, a song like that, uh, where you might have harpsichord, and you might have a sort of a trumpet part that sounds kind of Baroque uh, with imitation. So I would say the Beatles, probably, if I were to cite a group from the 20th century in the pop sphere, it would be the Beatles. In fact, there's a musicologist uh, who lives up in the Boston area, a guy named Joshua Rifkin. And uh, he arranged some uh, Beatles songs in, a, in the style of Baroque Concerti Grosso. And they're wild and wonderful. If you like the Beatles, you owe it to yourself uh, to go home and just Google uh, Joshua Rifkin, the Beatles. Could you play one? Uh, I'd be happy to if we have a moment. If we do, I'm, I'm in no rush, so. Can I, can I play it on the piano? Um, can I play? The Beatles and style. I couldn't improvise it. No, if I worked it out, I could. I could certainly do it. Let me give you uh, just a taste of it. Yeah, he called it the Bar Baroque Beatles book. And let's see what uh, we can actually see. What he says here. So the overture is, "I want to hold your hand." Let's see what that sounds like. called, uh, I think it's a viola for, it's a viola, a concerto for viola for him. Versus. <laughs> so he, piano versus orchestra. Right, piano versus orchestra. Um, Petey Q. Bach is a sort of a musician comedian in the style of Victor Borga. Uh, very clever and a, and a very, very uh, solidly grounded musician who really understands style and counterpoint. And same thing with Victor Borga, you know, he was a concert pianist in, uh, in Denmark, so. Um, 
But anyway, the, that's when you say, uh, do, can I think of anybody who uh, really comes to mind? I think of, of Joshua Rifkin's setting of the Beatles songs, and of course of Yngwie Malmsteen, the Swedish heavy metal guitarist, who uh, writes heavy metal fugues in the style of Bach. Um, and they're wild because you hear it and the style seems so incongruous, but it works. I think it works. Did you Google him? Um, who's that? Did we hear him? Oh, Ingve Momstein. Yes, I could. I, maybe I'll take another question and then we'll stick yeah. around for those who want to stick around for the end. Yes? Um, I have a question. When you find a piece you like and you go to buy it and yeah. there may be like 20, 25 different versions. How do you decide which one? It's very daunting. It's a great question, by the way. The question is, how do I decide if I, if I want to, let's say, buy a recording of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony? How do I know which of the 30 different versions are readily available? Well, with vocal music, it's a little bit easier because I think after a while you you learn which vocalists you like and. Uh, nowadays, you can go over to YouTube usually and sort of get a feel for which soloists you want to hear. So if you're going to listen to an opera, for example, it's a little bit easier uh, because you'll want to hear, you know, whatever soloist. For uh, Bach, for example, there are certain performers who are famous for interpreting Bach. Uh, in the realm of keyboard music, Glenn Gould comes to mind, the Canadian pianist and lunatic, uh, rest his soul. Um, Glenn Gould just had a, there was a certain feeling he brought to playing Bach, very crisp articulation, uh, a sense of real sort of vitality in the rhythms he, he chose to interpret. Um, with instrumental music, with Bach, you can't go wrong with any number of ensembles. I think probably two or three of the most famous in the world would be the Bach Collegium Japan, led by Suzuki. Uh, John Elliot Gardner is someone else who comes to mind, the English Baroque soloist. And then I think if I had to choose a third, I'd probably say Ton Koopman, who's Dutch, uh, and he uh, is uh, the leader of the Amsterdam, Phil uh, Amsterdam Baroque Orchestra, I think is his group. So I, I, to answer your question, if you have no experience, I think the best thing to do is probably ask somebody or look around and see what has the most uh, favorable reviews. Um, but having sort of come up during my college years listening to this, in a kind of snobbish environment. I think it's fair to say that Brandeis was a pretty musically snobbish environment in the department. Um, my professors were all very opinionated. And so um, I, you know, some of them I agreed with and some of them I would s sort of develop different opinions as I made my way through graduate school. But it's not always so easy. And sometimes you find a, an ensemble you've never heard of and they're terrific. And sometimes you go with a you know, recognized brand and it's a little clunky or you know banal or whatever. So I have um, my, some of my favorites, but it, they depend on the performance and it can depend on the, the repertoire. If I'm going to listen to a pianist play Scriabin, that same pianist is probably not going to record Bach. Uh, although they might. That's a good question. Uh, sir? Um, you mentioned the Baroque uh, recorder earlier. I couldn't help but notice that at the very end of the uh, the passion clip that you had there as a Baroque um, contrabassoon yes. that I had heard of before but never seen. The modern contrabassoon moves around twice. The Baroque contrabassoon is 10 feet long. Yes, you can it see it here. goes from one end to the other. Yes. I've never seen one before. Yes, um, the, the Collegium Japan is known for their um, dedication to what you might call period authenticity. In other words, they want to play with the instruments that Bach had. So they don't want to use an instrument that was created afterwards that would be an anachronism. So you wouldn't play, uh, for example, a modern contrabassoon or a modern flute. You'll see they're playing flutes here, these uh, two women on the right here, you can see on their laps. And those flutes are made out of wood, not out of uh, you know metal as a modern flute is. And these are harpsichords, yeah. One is for Mr. Uh, Suzuki and one is for uh, the other harpsichordist. So yes, these are Baroque instruments and uh, that started really I think probably sometime in the 70s or 80s, the idea of being really strict to the period. Before that, people really were not so strict and so you have recordings, like one of my favorite recordings of the St. Matthew Passion is um, it's Carl Boehm conducting and he's got a, a chorus of about 500 people. <laughs> which 
I don't think Bach ever saw a chorus of uh, 50 people, uh, so certainly not 500. And I don't mind the sound of it, of that huge chorus. It has its own sort of charm and its own quality, and the tempos are way too slow, and the sound is way too thick with way too much vibrato, and the instruments are modern instruments. Because in the 50s and 60s and 70s, they didn't care. But starting in the 80s and 90s, the ensembles became pretty fanatical, I would say, about period authenticity. And that's why you'll see these 10-foot contra bassoons. Thank you for coming, everyone. And I hope you'll be with us next week for yes. Music in the Age of Reason. Music in with, the Age of Reason. Yes, with Neil Harris.